Uh, good morning. Um, I'm not Samuel. I'm the other guy. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. And I wanted to talk about some work that we've been doing, looking at um, how function is improved or affected when we start to use power assisted devices on manual wheelchairs. But before I start my disclosures, so first of all, this was partly funded by Permobile. And um, this was uh, approved by an ethics committee at the University of Alberta in Canada. Um, also, it's a registered clinical trial. And um, if you want to look into more information, then are we posting this and you can go back and take a look at the details um, of the study and also the approval processes that have been involved in the study, uh, if you're interested. So why are we doing this? Um, I think most of you know that overuse injury is a serious problem for manual wheelchair users. And there are various figures out there in terms of the number of people affected. But I think this one is probably pretty representative from i which is about 70% of active wheelchair users at some point experience significant shoulder pain and upper extremity pain associated with overuse injuries uh, from propelling manual wheelchairs. The other factor that's important to bear in mind is that other people who may not be such active, strong uh, propellers of manual wheelchairs also experience loss of interaction and independence and autonomy as a consequence of the challenges of pushing a wheelchair around in a real world environment. So power assisted systems uh, have the potential to reduce some of these factors. And so what we wanted to do was to see what evidence we could see in a real world environment when we started to use power assisted systems in order to support manual wheelchair propulsion. So real world evidence is pretty hard to come by. So I'm a lab based researcher on the whole, and it's very convenient for me to have people come into my nice tidy lab with nicely controlled environments and do nicely controlled experiments, which have two very few confounding factors, which give me lots of statistical significance because I have very little variability that's associated with the environment in which I'm doing the testing. But the reality is very, very different. And this study, in a way, is a a very good example of the challenges that you have when you start to try and do these kinds of studies in the real world. So first of all, we know that there are a fair number of power assist devices out there that can support manual wheelchair users. And so this study was not designed to be a comparative study looking at different products, but it took one particular product and said, let's do a study to see what we can learn using this product about the effect of power assist when we're in a real world environment. And now I'm from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. And so we have kind of wintry conditions. So what we were also interested in was comparing what happened when we used a power assisted device in a, in a winter environment versus a summer environment, because it does have a difference in terms of the, the way that that technology works. When you look at the literature, there are numerous publications out there looking at the ways we measure the parameters associated with wheelchair propulsion. And so one of the ones that I really like is this study that was done a number of years ago, led by Rachel Cowan, but it was a collaboration among multiple centers that contributed data into a large database using the smart wheel uh, device that is used for measuring wheelchair propulsion parameters. And so some of the parameters that came out of their recommendations are listed here. So what we did was in, in designing our study was to try and adopt the goal of measuring those parameters in a real world environment. And so I'm going to talk about the quantitative side of this research. And so some of these are the objectives that we set out to, to uh, determine, and that was what are those key parameters like when you use an assistive power, power assist system and how does it differ summer versus, versus winter? We're also interested in, a, a, I think, a very important functional parameter and that is, so what is it like when you use a device like this to support you in propelling a manual wheelchair when you're trying to overcome a, an obstacle like a stoplight where you need to get across the road reasonably quickly in order to, um, get across before, before the stoplight changes. That's essentially how fast can you go? And then the last one is what about overexertion events? So to what extent are you applying forces that are really beyond the safe level 
for you as an individual in terms of your physical capacity? And can we come up with some measures that indicate whether or not you are exceeding your capacity? It's what we, we call you know, an overexertion event where you're perhaps 80% above your actual physical capacity to push your wheelchair. So those are some of the things we wanted to look at. And we also collected a lot of qualitative information. So around about two hours of interviews for each of our participants that's going to be another presentation some other time. Um, so we're just going to concentrate today on the quantitative side of things. So how do we do this? Because think about it. If you want to do a comparison between using a power assist system and uh, a non-power assist system, in other words, the regular use of the wheelchair, you can't use the power assist system as being the source of the data because it's not on there for half of the time. So you need a measuring system that enables you to look at some of those parameters um, and to do so in a way that does not affect the way the wheelchair would normally perform. So we developed a number of years ago a device we call Sagitta, you know, the arrow. And this attaches to the wheelchair, onto the spokes. And essentially, it's a device that incorporates an IMU, an inertial measurement unit. And what that can do is give us information about wheel angular velocity. It has a real-time clock built into it, has a sensor for temperature, um, and also has built in a GPS unit. The thing is that with that one parameter, that wheel angular velocity parameter, you can derive a lot of interesting information. And so if you collect that raw data from the wheel angular velocity, you can get a lot of other things that tell us about what's going on when that person is using their wheelchair. And so we'll be talking about a few of those in a minute. One of the things that did not work was the GPS for several reasons. One of them was because when you put a device on the side of a wheel, it's pointing sideways, not up. So it's not looking up to the satellites. So you have a lot of trouble actually getting satellite engagement in order to collect information outside. And of course, indoors doesn't work. So there is no GPS data that I'm going to be sharing with you. Um, it's OK. I don't think it really matters in terms of what we're trying to do. One of the things we learned in this study very early on was because we were asking people to use this for a period of time where we were not present, we were not in a position to be charging the device and making sure and maintaining it and keeping it going. So we needed to make a attachment that would enable us to attach the measurement system, the Sagitta, to the wheelchair and then have the user remove it and charge it up on their own. And so this is sort of magnetic coupling that we made. So it clips onto the wheelchair and, and comes off without the person having to have a lot of upper extremity dexterity to use it. The other thing was we wanted to use a inductive charging system rather than have the person plug it in for the same reason. We didn't want to have a limitation on upper extremity dexterity as a reason for not including someone in the study. So all of these are the real world things that if you're trying to do things in a much less tidy way than the classic researcher would, uh, you've got to deal with. And so you'll see the consequences in a minute. So we had a convenient sample of 20 experienced community-based wheelchair users. And of those, um, 17 were full-time, three were part-time, but they used a wheelchair for outside mobility exclusively. And I won't go into all the details. One person with for a reason related to their wheelchair and, and the demographics of our population, but it was a pretty representative, diverse um, community-based group of users. And what we did was we randomized them between using the, um, the Permobile smart drive first or not using the smart drive first. So um, these were the inclusion criteria. Again, you can look at this when, when we post this up on the website. So rather than spend time now, I won't sort of go over that other than to say that we were quite rigorous in our protocol to make sure that we understood what the inclusion and exclusion criteria would be, which is a requirement if you're doing something like a clinical trial. So uh, they were randomized, as I said, and the way it worked was that they used the smart drive for two weeks, which meant that for one week, they were kind of acclimatizing to it, getting used to how to use it. And then for the second week, that was where the majority of our uh, representative data was collected. And then the control data, which was without the smart drive, was collected for just one week. 
Um, and um, what we did was at the beginning of the of the smart drive sequence, um, the participants were trained by members of the Permobile team to make sure they knew how to use the device safely and effectively. We also um, had a charging protocol to make sure that the device stayed charged because if it wasn't charged, no data. And so uh, we trained folks on how to do that. And then we did this both in the summer and the winter. So basically the way it boils down is that it was like a month in the summer and a month in the winter for each of those 20 participants. So you're getting a feeling for the kind of size of the enterprise that this involved. Well, 20 gigabytes of data were collected 200 million lines of data were collected and 200,000 lines of analysis code had to be generated in order to deal with the complexities of doing a real world study like this. We used a mixed linear model analysis approach um, in order to look at the uh, in influence of the uh, intervention, which is the use of a power assist device versus non-using it um, for the population of people that we were working with. So this is the context we were working. We started in August 2019, and we all know what happened in 2019. That's my daughter. She's a nurse practitioner in Mount Sinai in New York. Um, that's right when we were getting this study underway. So immediately we hit the COVID nightmare in trying to implement the study. The other thing is that, as I said earlier on, in Edmonton, Alberta, winter goes on for a long time. So April 10th, uh, 2021, it was still snowing. And so one of the benefits of that was it gave us enough time to be able to do the winter part of the cohort. So um, we have beautiful river trails in uh, Edmonton. And one of the things we're really keen to see is improving accessibility to those trails. And so this kind of technology is the kind of technology that has the potential to be able to give people that kind of access. So here are some of the preliminary results. First of all, let's talk a little bit about the environmental temperature that we were working with. So this is the profile of the environmental temperature of the study itself. And so you can see the temperature range from minus 30 centigrade um, all the way up to round about plus 30 centigrade. So that's pretty typical for our environment. But of course, that wasn't what the person was necessarily experiencing. They weren't outside all of the time. Um, so they were inside. And so we also used the internal sensor in order to tell us you know, what temperatures they were actually experiencing. Problem number one for real world study. As soon as we put that sensor on top of a charging station, this charging station heated it up. And so now we got an artifact in the data because the charging time um, actually affected the sensor temperature measurements. So what we had to go in and do was to all of that data was to pick off those circumstances where the person was charging it and heating it up and remove that little segment of data. And then when you finish doing that, you end up with this temperature profile, which is the temperature profile of the people that actually experience those temperatures using the device indoors and out. Sort of information we can get from the IMU that I was talking about uh, is information that looks like this. So this is an example, I think, of one day where you can see these periods of activity, where you can see the velocity changing. You can see periods of acceleration where the pers person is pushing. And then you can see the accumulated distance that they were traveling in that day. And now you can aggregate that up over seven days. And so here's a profile, if you like, of the different um, velocities that person applied to their wheelchair as a distribution. So sometimes they were moving slowly, sometimes they were moving much more quickly. You know, what does that look like in the real world? Is, is the real world made up of lots of little small movements or lots of large big pushing movements? And how much did that vary across the population of people we were studying? And the same thing can be done with the acceleration data. Also, we can look at the duration of a push. So as the person is pushing, um, they're going to be pushing as in an epoch, so a period of time over which they're actually pushing before they stop pushing and do something else. And then five minutes, yep, that's perfect, thanks. Um, another parameter that we came up with, which I think is a useful parameter for us to work on going forward. So I think one of the things we've learned from doing real world analysis is that there's a lot of data mining that needs to be done for us to understand what really happens. And so one of the things when we use a power assist device is, of course, what happens is much of the time the person isn't pushing. 
um, they're starting up, they're accelerating, and then they're going at a steady speed, relatively speaking. And then they'll slow down when they get to the point, their destination, if you like. If someone is pushing the wheelchair manually, then what you see are lots of little velocity ratchets, if you like, in the data that indicate accelerate, deaccelerate, accelerate, deaccelerate. So it looks like a sawtooth. So if you look at the height of the sawtooth relative to the flat line you would get if you were just using the power assist device, you've got an idea of, of how much extra power is being put in by the person that is pushing the wheelchair. Um, and that is what we're calling the pushing ratio. So this is an indication as to how much the power assist device is actually helping the person and not having to waste energy by putting in velocity and losing it again because of the rolling resistance of the surface that they're pushing on. The smart driver has got an odometer on it, so it has the means to measure how far you go when the, when the smart drive is being used. And so what we were able to do is a comparison between our device, the Sagittar device, and the odometer that the smart drive has to, to validate essentially the, the, the device that we had developed. It's difficult to say that this validation would be absolutely a direct comparison one on one, because some things differ. There are periods of time when um, when the person is um, is is maneuvering um, and not going in a straight line where our algorithms assume a straight line pushing. And so these are responsible for some small differences between these two different measures of how far the person went. But I think surprisingly close in terms of how much the two systems agreed. So here we have a measure of the total distance the person traveled, summer versus winter. So you can see that during the summer, our wheelchair population traveled much further than they did in the winter. That's an indication of how our winter generates social exclusion for wheelchair users, maybe others as well. So just looking at the statistics that we, we created so far, and I think there's a lot more that we can gather from this data, these are some of the things that we saw. So we saw that uh, there's significant difference in the mean distance someone's traveling if they're using a power assist system versus just manual propulsion. And also that differs by season. Similarly, with velocity, they travel faster with the power assist. And that pushing ratio I mentioned is favorable um, in terms of using a power assist system. So my, my initial conclusions from the work we've been doing is that um, power assist significantly increased the total distance traveled by 56% in the summer and 58% in the winter. The average velocity was 18% higher in the summer and 36% higher in the winter when using a power assist system. And there was no detectable difference in the acceleration. And I think there's more work we need to do in looking at this acceleration data. And there was no detectable difference in the cadence when the person was pushing. And that again is a little tricky to interpret because part of the time when someone is using a power assist device, they're also steering by putting in little pushes that helps to keep it on track and deal with things like side slopes. So we need to be able to differentiate out more effectively the effect of some of those real world situations. We found the pushing ratio was low when using power assist. So I just wanted to thank a lot of people who did a huge amount of work. As I said, you know, 200 million lines of data is a lot of data to manage. And so uh, Sam, who couldn't come today, was really instrumental in making that happen. Emily Armstrong helped, helped to coordinate the study. And also we work closely with our colleagues in Permobile who really did a fantastic job in terms of training our participants and supporting the project in general. If you want to know more, please have a look at the, um, at the conference abstracts and um, information that we'll be uploading later. Thanks very much.